thing. Before we start, I just need to read a, a paragraph um, for those people watching the bro broadcast. This scrutiny committee meeting is being conducted remotely in accordance with the coronavirus regulations and the remote meetings protocol agreed by the council, which will operate alongside the council's standing orders to ensure that we continue to take democratic decisions in an open and transparent manner. I would remind members that this meeting is being live streamed to the public. Can I request therefore that you all switch off your cameras and mute your microphones when you're not speaking. This will ensure there's no unnecessary background noise and help with the audio and visual quality of the broadcast. Council standing orders and code of conduct, conduct will apply at all times. Thank you. Now this morning's meeting is to deal with one issue. May we first of all have apologies? No apologies received, Chair. Thank you, Neil. Uh, item number two, are there any declarations of interest? No, in which case we move to item three, which is minutes of the previous meeting, um, which was held on the 19th of January. So I will now run through those pages. Uh, if anyone has any comments, please feel free to say. Uh, we're looking first of all at page three, page four, page five, page six, page seven, and finally, page eight. Thank you, in which case we'll take it. That Chair, I have a question on page seven, if I may, please, matters okay. arising. Of course. Um, would you like to raise that question, Councillor? It's reference the extra IT equipment for schools. Yes. It's supposed to arrive at the end of January. Has it done so or are we still waiting? We're still waiting for our councillor. I shall chase her up with um, Sarah for you okay. straight after this meeting. Lovely. Thank you, Neil. Thank you for raising that, Councillor Watkins, because that, you know, is a, a massive issue at the moment. We need to ensure that all our children have had provision where necessary of the equipment that they can continue their learning. So you'll you'll chase that up, Neil, and let us know, please, will you? I'll do that straight after the meeting, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now we move to ooh, 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 item four. Um, and am I able to welcome officers to speak to this report? Yes, I see that we have Sally joining us and Caroline Ryan Phillips. Good morning to the both of you. Welcome to this morning's panel. Um, I think all our members have had opportunity to read through the report that you sent us, um, but I'm going to hand over to you now to uh, give us a verbal report. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for inviting us to come this morning. Um, obviously, as you, you say, um, members will have had access to the Youth Justice Recovery Report, which was prepared. Uh, the report was actually prepared um, for the Youth Justice Board and was something that we had to submit into the Youth Justice Board in line with all Youth Justice Services. So it's um, a, a document that um, had to be submitted all the way through. Um, I think, as you will see from the document, is that um, no surprise, it's been a really difficult and challenging year for everybody. Um, I'm, I'm sure none of you will be in the least bit surprised by that. But I think what's really clear from the report is the lengths that staff have gone to to endeavour to continue to provide a youth justice service in a meaningful um, way for children and young people and their families. Um, and more than that, I've also endeavoured to try to continue to develop the service over the course of the year. So it hasn't just been about a standing still of the service. It's about trying to really move things forward. Um, I think like all of children's services, if we look back to a year ago, 
um, and we look back to um, the beginning of March in 2020 when we were just all beginning to be hit by what was likely to become the reality for COVID, we would never have anticipated that we would still be here, that we would still be in a, in a position where we were operating under significant restrictions. Um, and again, Youth Justice, like all of Children's Services, has had to work within restrictions imposed on us by Welsh Government, by the UK Government, and particularly Youth Justice, because Youth Justice is largely a devolved power, so um, falls perhaps less within the ambit of Welsh Government and more within the Westminster Government, and that does sometimes impact on what we, on what we are and aren't able to do. And again, like Children's Services, Adult Services, Schools, and indeed all services across the Council, we've also been impacted by the capacity of our partners to continue to deliver. So Youth Justice um, is a service which is very much um, made up of partner agencies and is dependent on delivery with partner agencies. But again, as you can imagine, colleagues in the police service, in the health service, in education and in third sector organisations have been significantly impacted by the pandemic in various ways. So that in, in addition has impacted on how we've been able to deliver services. Um, I think Caroline and I are very happy to take any questions and we will do our very best to um, answer them um, as honestly as we can. And hopefully um, that's sufficient to start us off. Thank you very much, Sally. Uh, now, I hope our raise hand function is working. Um, do I see any raised hands, please, at the moment? No. In which case, um thank you for that additional information sally but i would like to ask um with regard to restorative justice what exactly are these children uh being how are they being treated in terms of restorative justice at what is a difficult time how are the children being treated or what actions are they undertaking for yes. restorative Yes, what, what actions are being undertaken to help children with restorative justice? Okay. I have experience having sat on the restorative justice panel yeah. and at that time there was very little other than litter picking, which I was really not happy with because I felt we needed to raise the esteem and build the, the for these children. So uh, the question I'm asking is, what is in place now, please? I suppose one of the things I just want to preface that with is that whatever we would or wouldn't have done a year ago has been massively impacted by the pandemic because there are so many things we quite simply cannot do, as you'll appreciate. Um, Caroline, do you want to just pick up an answer on that? Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you, Sally. Um, it's a really, really good question and I'm glad it's been asked because it's been one of the big things that we've put a lot of effort into changing. Uh, within the Youth Justice Service. Sally's absolutely right, Why we can't actually be out there in the community and um, doing different kinds of activities. What I can categorically say is that litter picking is absolutely a no-no uh, anymore in Youth Justice. I fundamentally banned it. Any reparation or, youth ju or restorative justice uh, work or activity that is carried out with any child now is meaningful and it has an educational element to it. So if I can back that up with an example, we had a child who was working with us on a charge of um, arson, starting fires, and as part of her reparation work, she did um, she designed a poster for the service talking about the dangers of, of fire lighting and um, utilising her art skills in a, in a really good way, positive way, that we actually then were able to put those posters up um, around and circulate them to our partners. So it's very much about trying to get children to learn from their mm. offending, but actually bring a whole level of education to it for them in a way that perhaps litter picking really doesn't. Thank you for that. I'm very, very pleased to hear it. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Routley, please. I see your hand is up. I believe Councillor Forsey oh, was before yes, myself. So, I'm so sorry. I, yes. I, I um, wouldn't want to jump in front of Councillor Forsey. No, uh, my mistake. Yeah, I do apologise. Councillor Forsey, please. 
Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm struck reading this report by how many times you've said this has worked so well, we're going to retain it after after the pandemic. So um, in a way, it, it seems like there's been a number of positive um, changes in, in practice that uh, the unfortunate circumstances have, have brought about. But one of the things that does seem to have caused difficulty seems to be different IT systems between different organisations. And I think we've had a similar thing um, between us and the police that, yeah. that different IT systems um, there, is, you know, causes a problem for us and it looks like it's causing a problem to, to you as well. You talk on page nine about um, referral order panels and um, I noticed that you tried to do this by phone and that was unsuccessful. Um, so I'm wondering what you've what what systems you do use now and and whether the IT systems have been resolved or whether it still continues to be an ongoing issue. Go on Caroline. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I can say that it has been resolved to some degree insofar as um, the there was an issue with the police being able to access uh, virtual platform that we would use and vice versa. Now, I and, and I've forgotten the name of it off the top of my head, but whatever platform, virtual platform the police use, we are now able to access that so that all panels are held virtually and actually are one of the big success stories for us during the pandemic. Because what we've seen is in terms of uh, post court or uh, orders is that um, we find that we're having much better attendance and engagement at these virtual panels, uh, which is different to engagement with children when we're doing, say, reparation or activities in the community. These are orders that they need to, and panels they need to attend. But actually doing it virtually, we find that they're far more engaged, but we've managed to overcome that particular IT issue. I think in, a, in an ideal world, we would all be on the one system and sharing everything, but we're, we're not quite there yet, are we? But certainly during the pandemic, we've been able to overcome that, yes. I mean, one of the interesting things is if we look at child protection conferences over this period in a similar way as Caroline is describing, after an initial kind of bumpy, how do we make this work? We're now at a position where we have 100% attendance at child protection conferences by professionals because it's actually easier, for example, for health and police colleagues to attend virtually than it is to have to come in for a meeting. And we have benefited um, youth justice and child protection services um, will all benefit from. The police have now funded a very large screen which has gone into the Civic Centre specifically for us to be able to do blended meetings. So when restrictions drop a little bit, we will be in a position where we'll be able to have some people doing this and some people actually in the room using the large screen. So um, I think we have learned a lot, but I do think it is absolutely one of the areas across the board in children's that we will look to continue some elements of virtual meetings. So after the initial bumpy bit, I think we've, we've, we've worked really well on that and come to a position which is much stronger. Thank you. Yes, I'm interested to know what system you are actually using and I think it's clear that blended meetings are going to be the way forward because whilst there are some disadvantages there are also considerable advantages like you say in in attendance um, um i mean it's, it's, it's easier for some people i mean I, obviously we're very heavily dependent on teams as you'll be aware so we're that's the primary and, and i think there are a lot of good reasons for that I mean, when we went into the pandemic, uh, looking back a year, a number of agencies were still heavily dependent on Skype, which obviously is now being phased out. We weren't in that position, but some of our partners were. Um, and we also have had this tussle over the use of Zoom, which has, it continues to be a challenge really, where some organisations do use Zoom and where others think that the security system challenges linked to Zoom are an issue. So we're still ironing that one out. The other platform that we've all had to get used to using, and a little bit less so in the criminal world, but in the family court and to some extent in criminal court, is the use of the cloud-based system that the courts are using. 
Um, and that has caused us some howlers of headaches at various times. Um, but again, gradually, we've got to a position where we're more equipped to use that. And when it comes to blended, I, I am absolutely sure that whatever else, that will be the way forward for us is that we will be looking at blended arrangements. That answer your question, Councillor Forsey. You're muted. Yvonne, you are muted. Sorry, I just wanted to make one more comment, if I may. Um, and, and that was that these IT systems I wonder whether this ought to be referred to partnerships committee um, in terms of working with partners such as the police because the IT, um, you know, is such a crucial part and is going to be such a crucial part of um, our, our, you know, everybody's work going forward. So I just finish with that comment. Thank you. I, I think that's a very good comment and I think it's one that we as a panel could recommend. Thank you. Um, this word blended, I only ever referred to it in terms of cooking and now we're using blended for, for everything. <laughs> Councillor Routley, I see you have your hand raised. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. First off, can I, can, I, can I thank you all for the work that you've done, the youth justice system uh, throughout the pandemic. And I've read your report um, and it is about going forward. I wish to speak about not reflecting too much going back. Uh, can I can I say this? I think. I think your uh, the work you do, the initiatives that you've come up with such as and they may they may seem trivial but they're not trivial indeed, not to me anyway. Um, identifying a safe venue for our young people to prepare the pamper bags as a part of their repropriation hours, um, uh, giving pamper bags to the NHS, uh, making links with local community homes for older people and young people, making friendship bands, distributing them, writing a card, message, and to show how much they care. Now, one of the one of the the issues, um, your issues are the same. Your client base, if I call them that, are the same of many PRUs right throughout Wales. And there does seem to be uh, there does seem to be people from, who enter PRUs would have would could find themselves in the criminal justice system and so you're working you're working jointly there so can i can congratulate you on in on that initiative because i think the understanding of of where we are now i mean we're, we're, we're disengaged at, at, at the present time so that understanding of where we are understanding the needs of <coughs> all members of society is a part of re-engaging them to identify whatever they do will impact on poor old Mrs Jones and Mr Jones down the road who they actually like and sent a card to and there's hundreds of this so can I congratulate you on that thank you can I now move to if it's okay chair can I move on to another question Yes, you can. One Thank more. Thank you, um, <clears throat> I look at other authorities and how they do things, and especially during the pandemic. And there's a similarity running amongst everybody with variations in it. Can you um, can you ensure me and, and, and explain to me? I noticed on one part of your report you say that uh, you exploit the use now, if that's the right word to use, the use of Teams, Zoom, Skype, other methods to have contact with families. And yet it is recognised, it's recognised in your, in your report, that there has been mixed responses to this shift in how you work for both children and staff. 
and that some children prefer virtual medium, uh, so the, 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 the Zoom and the Teams meetings, and others, you need to find it difficult to engage. But also the overriding thing is actually difficult to understand via Teams the behavioural difficulties, the infrastructure of the home, what is going on in the home. Yeah. Now, you refer to um, a lot to, so you've moved away from that. This is what the report is telling me. You've moved away from that and you're slowly going on to Zoom. So that's creating a, a safeguarding issue. So that's creating a safeguarding issue. Um, uh, but you may deal with children under that safeguarding in a different way. You refer to post pandemic. Well, I, I don't know when post pandemic is going to be. And then you say when it's safe to do so, you will restore all these good practices. Well, in the neighboring authorities to us, um, they're still having face to face contacts with their client base in education and in um, in in the um, in the youth justice system and in the PRUs and the home visits are going face to face. I just want to know why we haven't fully embraced that again, because with the use of, of um, protective equipment, the full protective equipment face to face can start. And that I suppose have your team who will provide that face to face, have they been vaccinated yet? Okay, so just so, to pick that, yeah. And, and if you're not sure of what I said, please come back because it's sure. not okay. to catch you in any shape or form. No, no. It's going okay, so um, just Councillor Rattley, just to be clear, we've actually visited all the way through. We've never stopped visiting and providing face-to-face -face services ever, not okay. from March Good. the 23rd onwards. Okay. So we have um, not visited at the same rate and we have risk assessed. So if we are able to safely work with a family without visiting in line with the restrictions, that's what we've done. But if we haven't, and if we have a, a just a little bit of doubt that we're able to work with a family like this or on WhatsApp or whatever, then we visit. So that hasn't changed. Um, we've had access to PPE pretty much all the way through. We had a, a slight challenge at the beginning, but we got there reasonably quickly. So our staff have had access to PPE pretty much all the way through. Um, and I think we've worked with our staff. I think Caroline would agree to, to to really manage the risk involved because we can't place up a staff in a position where they take unnecessary risk, but we have a duty under safeguarding. So just to reassure you, we have never stopped visiting. We're in exactly the same position as our neighbouring authorities. We work very closely with the four local authorities within Gwent and we are absolutely clear that the position that we take is the same. Um, we have a shared approach throughout in terms of risk assessment to how we work directly with children and young people. So that's the first element of it. Um, will we get back to a point where we were visiting as we were, say, in January of 2020? Um, yes, we probably will, but we're not there yet. Um, I think that in the same way as all of the restrictions are still very much in place for all of us, um, but we are out there, our staff are out there day in, day out, weekends, the whole time. That hasn't changed. In terms of vaccination, um, a significant proportion of the social care staff, including youth justice staff, mm. have now received a first vaccination and a number are now receiving a second vaccination. Not all, and it hasn't been without its challenges, that process, mm -hmm. but the majority have now been vaccinated. Uh, okay, sure, thank I you. I'm sorry. Does that answer your question, Councillor Routley? Yes, it does. And can I can I can I add to that as well and say that I did read your report right the way through. Thank you. And that didn't come across clearly in the report that you were continuing visiting. Maybe just as a learning curve. Okay, thank you. To bring that clearly across across. Um and, and can I just further how how is the the benefit? What are the benefits 
of you moving to the civic center. <coughs> Can you tell me the benefits that you've experienced since that move? I mean, obviously, the, the move to the civic center took place right at the start of the pandemic. So it's, not, it's, it's been in these times, not in normal times. Mm -hmm. We had discussed prior to the pandemic a potential move of the Youth Justice Service to the Civic Centre anyway, and that's largely rooted in wanting to bring our teams together. So at the same time as the Youth Justice Service came in, we also brought in our Prevention Service and our Family Support Service because there is real merit in having staff from different areas of children's services and indeed adult services based together so that there's communication. Now, clearly, for much of the last year, we've not been displaced, so we've yet to really fully utilise the benefits of that move. Um, but I would say that over the summer, when we had a greater number of staff in the offices, it, it inevitably means that there's more communication between different teams and different areas. So it, it, it's a it's a positive for us. I I I you know that's exactly what I thought and. And my final point, Chairman, and then I'll move on, move off. Yes, because we do have my some final, waiting. My final point is, um, would you be able, this report was excellently produced, it gives us a, um, it gives us a way forward and, and an insight into the last 12 months, but also an insight into where we, we are going. Will we be able to have such a report that looks at the impact on the families and young people that we served throughout this pandemic and the outcomes from their point of view. Um, I think that that's obviously a very significant piece of yeah. work. Um, yeah. uh, we have actually already undertaken some work looking at the impact of the pandemic and, and the views on the families that we work with and, the, and their views of the service that they've received. And we've undertaken a parallel report in relation to staffing and um, I have sent those in for potential scrutiny to have a look at. Those are quite short and early reports um, and they're uh, the whole of children's services so they don't cover specifically youth justice. Um, I mean we we are very willing to review as we go forward. I think if I'm honest I think that will be a little way off a because as you rightly say when is post pandemic we don't know um, but also just because of a capacity issue in pulling that together is that that would be a challenge whilst we're still working through this. Thank you. Well, you raised some good points there, Councillor Routley. It really wasn't clear in the report uh, with regard to any face to face. So it's good to hear that that where it is necessary and it often is, I'm sure. It, it is happening. Councillor Marshall, you've been very patient with your hand raised. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you, Chair, and apologies for coming a few moments late to, to the meeting, Chair. Um, and just to say, I've also picked up the, the part about partnerships by um, my, my colleague there as well. Um, that kind of links into to some of the stuff that I, I was looking at myself. Um, with reading the report, um, we, we look at the time about um, about the courts and about partnerships, about police and things like that. So I think it is relevant to, to add it in. Um, just what is the relationship like at the moment with the police and things like that? Do you feel that you're building up this new culture, I think what was the terminology uh, in one part of the report, um, and especially looking at the reclassification of certain um, cases? Um, I, I think it was under the prevention out of um, court prevention, uh, sorry, disposal cases, um, about how you're looking at classification, how you're working with them, the systems, just the overall partnership. How do you think it's working and do you think it's bettered by the work that you're currently doing as part of COVID and moving forward as part of this new structure um, and looking about the outcomes? Um, so when we're looking during this time of COVID and post-COVID, how are we looking at these outcomes for the young people? Are they changed? Are they bettered? Um, for, you know, from that, that work that you've been doing there um, as well there. And just to um, know what, what's the other partnerships like when we're talking about things like um, child exploitation, uh, working with the schools, working with other partners. Um, it is something that I'll hopefully link in with the chair of partnerships as well, but I think it is relevant to the way that you're working with these people for outcomes that it, it, it can be answered here if the, the chair um, will, will permit. Thank you. Um, Caroline, shall I go to you for that? Because <laughs> operationally, fine. I think you're much better placed than I am for that. No Thank problem. you. No problem. 
Um, I certainly would say that the partnerships, all the partnerships that we have in place are very positive. Um, we, it is a multi-agency service, uh, so we do have representation from the police, from uh, CAMS, from speech and language, and we have very, very good partnership uh, representation at the board level, at the strategic partnership board level. Um, operationally, I would certainly say that our work and uh, collaboration with police, particularly during the course of the pandemic, has improved. Um, we have been right from the start when we knew that courts were closed initially and there was a backlog of court cases. Um, right from the beginning, I would certainly say that we had our attention on any of our young people who were headed in that direction, making sure that they were not drifting, uh, particularly those children who were 17, because the last thing we want is for some of those children to be charged and in court as an adult and therefore uh, sentenced as an adult. So we've, we've been all over that all the way through the pandemic. We've been doing some really, really good drilling down of data in recent months with our uh, regional partners. Um, so really looking at where what young children are in the system. Um, and we can now categorically confirm there is no court backlog, there is no case backlog waiting for to come through our doors. What we have established is that actually grant wide, there's only about 19 cases in the system, in the police system, and we are doing some active exploration at the moment to see where they are in the process to make sure that they come through. So we have a very, very good analysis uh, uh, arm to our partnership with police. They're members of the Bureau panel. They are, um, support our police officer in the service. So they are very, very, very uh, intrinsic, uh, I suppose, to how we are working with our children and making sure that no child is lost and no child is, is able to drift in the, in the system. Um, we have very good links with our CP, our child protection colleagues around the exploitation strategy meetings. And that's been a real added benefit of some of the work that Sally just talked about, about the, the greater integration of youth justice within the wider Ch uh, Children's Services Directorate. Whereas previously, I would say they were perhaps a little further apart, but that's been a really, really added benefit of bringing the whole thing together so that even at a low level, if we've got children that we're concerned about um, from an exploitation uh, perspective uh, or possibly being excluded from education, you know, the, the lower level concerns that haven't quite reached the high threshold, we now link in with the child protection uh, exploitation meeting. So there is a free flow of information and information sharing to make sure that the right response is, is um, provided and, and at least considered for some of these children. So, you know, my view is we have very, very good partnership working. There's a lot of change going on in terms of how as a service we are working with children. We, you, you, you will be familiar possibly with the Welsh Government blueprint that came out in 2019. And that very much dictates the way we all as partners in the Youth Justice Service are working and responding to these children. So very much looking at keeping these children out of the criminal justice system, identifying them much earlier. What can we do to um, uh, offer support to these children before they reach uh, the point of arrest and charge? And therefore, how do we then meaningfully, holistically work with them from a family perspective as well? It is worth noting that actually um, over half of our existing caseloads now are on a preventative basis and not court orders. So that will show how much the, the, the change in landscape has, has happened with, within uh, youth justice. So much looking at these children differently, looking at them as children, understanding their behaviours, understanding what is their story behind their behaviour? And as a partnership group in the service and outside of the service, I would certainly, I, I'm very happy with the way it's going. I feel that we are all working towards that same way, that same approach of, okay, understanding these children as children first and foremost, 
and then working backwards. Did that answer your question, Councillor Marshall? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got an additional, if that's OK, if I um, ask permission from the Chair, please. Yes, yes you may. Thank yes. you, Chair. Um, so it sounded really positive then, a lot of lessons learned about the working together. And I know um, during these times, obviously, partnerships are, are basically pulled, contracted, and it's very, very stressful in times that, that they can break. But it's really, really good and positive to hear that it's been quite smooth uh, with really good outcomes, smoother outcomes as well. Um, to build on that question, um, just want to know what, what do you feel are the challenges moving forward from this point onwards to, to post COVID, both in terms of the COVID recovery, but also the, the kind of partnerships, whether it's internally within council or externally outside of council, please. Thank you. Um, just, I suppose the, the most immediate thing, and again, I'm, I'm sure that councillors will be aware, is that I think we all have a considerable concern about the impact of the past year on children and young people. Yeah. So in terms of COVID recovery, um, I think in youth justice services, in children's services, in education, we share very considerable concern, anxiety, um, about what next because obviously we now have a year where for a whole generation of children and young people they have missed out and it doesn't matter how we dress it up they have missed out there's no other way to describe it um, and from very young children who've missed out on countless developmental and relationship opportunities to teenagers you're losing a year of your life at 14 I mean, oh, it, it, it just breaks your heart, really, when you think of the learning and the life experiences that you accumulate as a teenager and that's gone. And that's before we think about education um, and what they've lost. And it's also before we think about for a number of our children and young people um, family members who will have been directly impacted by COVID itself. So there is a significant amount of loss for children and young people. And I, I think Caroline and I and our colleagues are really concerned about that going forward. So how do we address that? And I think that is a real challenge for all of us, particularly um, when we're likely to be looking at a degree of austerity at some point in the future. So that is, is an issue. We have begun some thinking about how we do that. We've begun some thinking across partner agencies and bringing together. There was a meeting last week where we brought together a number of agencies to try to think about what do we need in the system for repair for children and young people and their families? Um, but I do think that is a concern and a challenge for all of us going forward. Um, the other added element to that is staff. Um, I mean, Councillor Marshall, you touch on colleagues in the council and, and intra-council intra relationship. I think for us, we have a workforce that, as, as we've said, has worked every day since March the 23rd. Um, who have experienced the same sorts of losses and the same sorts of challenges. Um, I'm fortunate my children are adults. I haven't had to homeschool. I haven't to do that, had to deal with any of that. But when I look at some of my colleagues who've had to deal with the personal challenges of family members being ill, some of them being unwell, and then having to cope with the huge um, issues in terms of homeschooling and their own children, I think we have an issue with staffing as well. And our staff are tired. I'll be honest, I think that it's fair to say that people are tired and just like all of us, the winter has gone on and on and on and on um, and it has equally for us. So in the same way as children and young people and families have been impacted, so have our staff. And whilst we have countless things in place in the council to try to address that, um, I still think that is of concern to us going forward. Um, we will at every stage try to address that and make sure that staff are supported. I mean, in children's services, we have been really boring about making sure people take annual leave, even though they can't go anywhere. We've absolutely, you know, I was very proud that children's services had the highest rate of annual leave taken despite the pressures on us. Um, but it is it is difficult going forward. And I, there's no easy answer to this, Councillor Marshall. It's going to be a tough post recovery. Absolutely. I, I would just add to that that, you know, the mental health of, of all these children and that goes across right across children's services anyway. It, it's always been uh, a concern of ours. We are doing everything we can to consider ahead because I think 
further down the line, we are going to see some of this stuff coming through. Um, so we really need to be prepared. We need to think about how creative and out of the box and how collaborative we can work together with our partners to provide that the, the level of support that's going to be needed. So at the moment, for example, with the potential return to schools and education, it's very much rallying around and looking at, OK, how can we support our colleagues in education on the ground? What do we need? How, who can be available, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it's fair to say the mental health wellbeing of these children and teenagers is, is of a concern. Thank you. I think you are absolutely right. Collaboration will be very pivotal going forward. I have five grandsons aged five to 19, and each of them has been affected heavily in quite you know different ways but nonetheless the impact on all of those children and thousands of others has been enormous and will continue to be i'm really pleased to hear your move you've moved this service into the civic center i understand the difficulties at the moment in terms of being office based but i think going forward that will help with collaboration. Councillor Cleverly, you've been very patient. Please feel free. You're muted. <laughs> You're muted, Janet. Jan, you're still muted. Still muted? Chair, I don't know if Jan wants to write the um, question in the answer box. I'm sure she can hear it, but she she would get a quicker answer maybe um, rather than coming off and back on again. Uh, did you hear that, Jan? Would you like to type your question in? No, we can't hear you. Sorry. No, I know you don't know why I'm lip reading now. <laughs> Adding to my <laughs> non-existent skills. I can't hear you. Would you like to try and type a concise question in? I'm so sorry we can't hear you. Like you, I do not understand why. I don't know if there's anything you can help Councillor Cleverly with, Neil. But in the meantime, Jan, can you type your question in the chat box where it says type a new message? Oh, I've, I think she's lost the chat, chat box. Have you lost the chat box, Jan? Sure, she is typing on the chat box. It does oh, indicate. Right. Thank you. Right. right. Yes, she is. I can see that now. but I can't see anything coming through. I have nothing showing in terms of what Councillor Cleverly is typing. Can anyone else see it? We, we won't show until she um, sends it and press enter. It will come through in a moment. OK. Thank you for that, Councillor Marshall. You're obviously much more skilled than me at this IT. <laughs> I rely on my 15 year old. Right, uh, this is Councillor Cleverly's question. It's about the youth court. How, how, how it's still in Cumbran and is it still open or is it in lockdown still? Caroline, I'll go to you for that. Yeah, that's fine. It's, um, it, it's still open. Uh, like all youth courts, it did suffer some restrictions right at the very beginning last April time and courts were closed, I think, for about six, eight weeks. But the, gradually they've reopened and Cumbran and Newport are our regular youth court hearings. In fact, we had some, some staff attending there today with, with some children. So, yes, it's still there, it's still available and it's still running. I hope that answers your question, Dan. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other hands raised, but I'd like to ask a further question. 
Chair, yeah. you put my hand up again if you don't mind. It, it was put up again as a piggyback yeah. question to, to my last one, if that's OK. And then Kate Ever Watkins, it's please, Chair. Only, yeah, it's only just come up on my screen, um, Councillor Marshall. So please ask your question and then I'll ask mine. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you for that. Um, so it's just building up of the last question. We heard a very um, good answer. Thank you very much about the internal challenges. And um, just to piggyback, I didn't quite get a lot of the the external side and just if there is external challenges, what they are, because we knew before um, COVID kicked in um, that there was a lot of challenges around the waiting times for CAMs and mental health and stuff like that um, and, and other challenges. So just want to hear what the external challenges may be moving forward as well, please. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Councillor Marshall. Um, I, I think that the external challenges are very similar, really. I mean, they're obviously that staff in external agencies are struggling in the same way as that our own staff may be. In relation to our relationships with child and adolescent mental health services and primary mental health services, um, with well, in terms of youth justice, we have embedded CAM support within the service. I, I think. Caroline and I would both say it continues to be an area of challenge. There is a great deal of partnership work that is um, ongoing um, across mental health. And you, you may be aware that Gwent has in fact been um, almost a beacon in relation to progress in this area, which makes some of us take a, something of a sharp intake of breath on at times. But in terms of early intervention, things like the community psychology service, attachment and trauma, all of which have benefited Youth Justice. Uh, Youth Justice Service has um, had input from Attachment and Trauma this year, which has been beneficial. Um, we regularly access the Community Psychology Service. Um, and Caroline, with a slightly different hat on, um, is responsible for preventions in the wider sense, not just in prevention. So has been very closely linked in with the work that we've been doing with primary mental health, which is about those earlier interventions. Um, we're also aware that there is an active development of a whole school approach in relation to emotional well-being for children across Gwent, and that's being led um, by the psychology service. Um, there are a number of routes being explored to improve relationships between child and adolescent mental health services, children's services, youth justice services and the police. I think we've got better. I think we still have a way to go. Um, I mean, I, I am, I, I certainly am in a position now where if we do have children that are involved potentially in um, with challenging behaviour or particular offending, we at least have got good contacts with those that we need to speak to. And I think that's really important and gives us a route in. I can think of a case that we're currently working with where it was very easy for us now to be able to go to the right person to find support for the children involved in that case. Whereas I think even 18 months ago, we would have struggled with that. Whereas now we're able to go to those those people and work jointly so that it's not about us. It's not about um, psychology. It's not about psychiatry. It's not about the community nurses. It's about all of us trying to come together to a, for a plan. Have we got it right? No. Um, have we got a long way to go? Yes. Is it improving? Yes. Um, so I, I think that probably is, is as good as it's going to get in relation to those, those relationships. Um, I think when you look more broadly and you look at our relationships with third sector agencies, for example, we've got very strong and very good working relationships with substance misuse services. Um, and some of the other agencies that we work with in the third sector who in all sorts of ways play a role with youth justice services and wider children's services. Um, but partnership, you know, it, partnership was easy. We wouldn't need a scrutiny committee looking at it, would we? And it is a constant that we have to keep working at it. Um, does, does that answer your question, Councillor Marshall? Yeah, thank you, Sally. Just to see if there's anything that we could hear that may be able to, to put pressure on anyone as a speaker in the way that we can, um, mm -hmm. things like police or whatever locally or anything else like that there that you feel that we could help with um, to, just to, to mention it. But yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Sally, I think, you know, the issues around CAMs, for instance, and CAMs will be hugely important in terms of the children as well that you work with. Um, there's been issues around the, you know, CAMs and access to CAMs for these children for a long time. And that is definitely some work that needs to be 
uh, speeded up, um, I think would be the term I'd use. The question I wanted to ask is, is this, has there been an increase in children um, finding themselves within the youth justice system through the pandemic? And how has that impacted on staff, if it is the case that those numbers have increased? Caroline's probably best place to answer that. That's absolutely fine. Um, interestingly, our numbers have slowly increased over the course of the pandemic. But as I mentioned earlier, that's not down to court statutory orders coming through. That's because as a service, we have been very proactive in engaging and collaborating and making sure that people knew that there was support there from youth justice. So as I said, our, our, our cases have gone up, but actually the highest percentage is in prevention cases. So these are cases who are working with us on a voluntary basis um, and we are identifying these children much earlier before they become known to the criminal justice system. So that has, that has, that is good news for us because actually that's what we want to do. If we're doing our job well, actually we're stopping these children from reaching yeah. the criminal justice system. Um, and just in terms of some reoffending rates, just to kind of balance that out with what's coming through the door and, and what is coming back. Um, the, Reoffending rate is it, these are cohorts of children who are tracked over a period of 12 months. And I can say that in the in the last cohort we tracked um, pre court. So pre court will be those children who have not been charged at court. So you're talking about preventative referrals or uh, community resolutions. Um, 28.6 of those children have reoffended and post court. Um, which is children charged at court, referral order and above, we are seeing a 25% uh, reoffending rate. What I would add to that though is whilst those percentages might sound high or low, depending on what your perspective is, the numbers are actually very small. So when I say 25% have reoffended, we are only actually talking about two people. So it's, it's very it's very small numbers, but we are tracking them so that we can do our very best to kind of break cycles and patterns of behaviour and re-engage with the families where we can. Um, in relation to the staff, uh, I'm not quite sure what, what you mean. How, how are the staff managing the increase in referrals? Well, it, it sounds very much as though you're doing some very, very good work, but it will involve, you know, staff. Uh, and I'm just wondering what the pressures are, because we have we have a responsibility to care for our staff also. And in the good work that you're doing, uh, it's inevitable that it's going to put more pressure on staff and our duty of care to them is very important. So I'm asking the question, uh, you, as, you as their managers, uh, you know, what's the impact on them? Are they all being cared for? Mm. I would certainly like to say I think they are. Um, you know, all staff have access to huge amounts of support from their direct managers. They have supervision. They have access to all the corporate wellbeing and care first um, uh, support services. Um, what I will say, I think what's really important to note, sort of running alongside this, is that there has been quite a significant culture shift in the service um, whereby staff are being very, very supported to develop and be autonomous and be creative in their work. And as a result of that, I think because we have a different culture bedding in, we have, um, I think we have a, a higher morale. I think we have a happier workforce. And the, I would go so far to say I think the staff will say they feel more valued um, because actually what they are doing is they are having a chance to actually make a difference now in the work that they're doing. And, and that comes with that preventative early intervention uh, creativity uh, that perhaps wasn't um, as, as robust earlier. Um, 
And I think it's also a final point you could say. I think apart from a couple of long standing staff members with long standing issues, we've actually seen sickness levels significantly drop in the staff. Um, because actually they, they they seem to be happy and there's a very, very clear open door to all managers if they want to discuss, uh, you know, we're very accessible. But my view and my observation, my experience is I have felt that the staff have, are in a good place. I think morale is quite high and they are very, very engaged, are incredibly passionate and child focused. Thank you. Thank you very much. And can I just say, I think on behalf of every member of this panel, we'd very much like you to pass on to all the staff our, our thank yous and good wishes, particularly thank yous for all the good work they're doing. And to, you know, you as managers for introducing changes of a real positive nature. Thank you. Now, um, I don't see anyone else with, oh, a hand raised. Trevor, uh, Councillor Watkins, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the, both officers for the comprehensive report which they put through. It's very comprehensive and it, it's very informative. Um, the question I have is regards to the uh, amount of court proceedings um, that hasn't gone ahead um, and the pressures which Sally made a comment on in regards to the pressures which staff are under at the moment, do they envisage an increase in um, people coming through the court proceedings and if so that how much pressure is that going to put on the staff which are there at the moment and if so, how are you going to manage that? Uh, will we be requiring to get more staff in to deal with those pressures? Um, thank you, Councillor Watkins. I think um, we, we're not anticipating that there's going to be a significant increase in the amount of court work within youth justice. That's not something that we're anticipating happening. Um, I mean, I think as Caroline's just talked a little about that, um, what we've seen is an increase in our numbers, but very much around preventative work rather yeah. than court work, which is um, and there's no reason to think at the moment that that won't continue. Um, we're not seeing any sign that there's going to be a partic particular challenges um, around increases in work that would lead to court at the moment. Um, and it, I suppose I suppose it's just to reiterate that we don't have a big backlog in the Youth Justice Court. We don't, we're not seeing outstanding cases, sure, unlike sure. in the Adult Criminal Court, where obviously there are very significant delays. That's not true in Youth Court, which is, um, I, you know, and that, I suppose that's credit to the way that the Youth Court is administered, that that's not happening. But also I think it's probably indicative of the lower numbers that are needing to go through because of the good preventative work that's taking place. Um, so we don't anticipate an increase in that area of work. And I, again, I suppose, as Caroline touched on, is that what we currently have in youth justice is, is a, um, a really committed and motivated staff group whose morale is high. So um, I think we would have, I'm never 100% confident, that would be foolish, but I, I think we would be confident, um, but always with that measure of, uh oh, something could come at us tomorrow. But as we stand confident that we're unlikely to see an increase and that our staff are therefore able to manage with the workload that they currently have. So we're aware of any, uh, the amount of um, people going through the courts, are we? Yes, we are. So, I mean, we, we yeah. have a very good handle on what's coming. Um, and we're involved with things before there's even a, a whisper of a charge very often. So from the moment that a child is perhaps possibly being questioned or involved in the system, we're involved right from the moment that they're first involved with the criminal justice system. We're there. Excellent. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any further hands raised. So. That being the case, can I say a very big thank you to both Sally and Caroline. I think we've heard some very positive information this morning following on from the report. And I would say thank you to both of you for attending today. And I will repeat, please send the thanks of everyone on this committee 
to all the staff involved with the work that you're doing. Thank We've you. Built it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you for coming. We'll, we'll let you go free now. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs> um, I think that just leaves uh, the rest of us as panel. Uh, conclusion item number five. Conclusions of committee reports. Um, committee will be asked to formalise its conclusions, recommendations and comments on previous items for action. For actioning. Do you want to come in there, um, Neil? Yes, Chair. Um, yeah, it's just to see really if the committee were happy with the report which um, was received the day and what um, comments or recommendations they would like to leave with Caroline and um, Sally. Notice one of the um, the comments that Councillor Routley made was um, that in the report um, there should be more there should be more evidence, yes. Oh, more evidence, yeah, oh, sorry. Yes. No, sorry to interrupt, Neil. No, 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 sorry, I was talking through my notes. <laughs> yeah, you did, uh, you did make a good point there, Will, that it, it gave us a lot of information, but we, we needed a little bit more, perhaps, about um, just case histories, confidential case histories, to give us a it clear... It wasn't clear on the face-to-face -face issue on the report, that was all. Sorry? It wasn't clear about the face to face that were taking place in no. the report. That was all. Well, that maybe is a comment that we can uh, we can make. Um, yeah, can I put a proposal in for the one to, to send um, to partnerships? Um, Neil, I don't know if you want to speak with the chair like I will um, about putting this maybe as a gender item when we look at looked after children and the fostering service. Um, yeah. I think it would probably fit in well all together with the same people. Yeah, that's no problem. I can um, yeah. raise that with um, Councillor Clark. Thanks, Councillor. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, happy to add to that if necessary, um, Neil. Thanks very much, Chair. Any, any, any other comments that uh, councillors would like to uh, put forward? Well, I, I think there's a bit of an issue, IT issue, with compatibility between the council and the police. I think um, that's yeah. known, Yvonne, isn't it? We, we've met that at full council, haven't we? Well, exactly. I don't know, you know, how, where, when this issue is going to be. You've gone mute. We don't we don't want this to be an ongoing issue, do we? You, well, you know, I don't know how, where, when it's going to be resolved, but it, it needs to be tackled, I feel, uh, at some point. The, the other question I would like to ask you, Chair, um, is we've got quite a lot of information here about the staff and the staff's way of working and, and a number of really positive changes do seem to have come out of this way of working. Uh, which is really interesting, but we don't seem to have much information about the children and the number of children and, and young adults in the system. I don't know if we'll be getting that um, at a future point. I, I don't know if that's on our future agenda forward work plan, because I, I'd like to look into that to see what sort of stages um, various clients are at. You know, they talk about pre um, pre-court, um, through the well, court, we, provincial, we that sort of thing. It would be quite reasonable, I feel, for us to ask with regard to those numbers, Neil, the, the, the children they're working with on a preventative basis and the children who are actually going through the system. Um, but I think this issue of uh, incompatibility with technology, that's something that should go through the Partnerships Committee. Yeah, I can raise that with the chair and also um, I think it is ongoing work with SRS as well um, yeah. in regards to the, the police yeah. side that is because they got different um, settings on their end and different. Um, I find that very strange given that SRS provides the IT service for all the authorities across Gwent together with the police. I think they they got different builds to us, Chair Bike, and certainly chase that up. Well, I think, Nivan, you've raised a good point there, and I think that should go to the Partnerships Board and SRS. Because it's not helpful if incompatibility exists, is it? 
You've raised your hand, John, yes. Yeah, I, I just listening to colleagues and, and yes, we need more information, maximum information, but we must bear in mind that a lot of this information is confidential. Mm -hmm. because we're dealing with children and we're dealing with different cases and there's got to be that understanding that I, we can... I have made that point that, you know, case history should be confidential. That's absolutely right and proper. But I think by the same token, it would just be um, helpful to have one or two case studies that we could look at uh, on a confidential basis. Okay. Councillor Marshall. Thank you, Chair. Um, linking on to what Yvonne was saying is one of the challenges, and I think we, we heard a lot about the, the challenges, and that's why I was trying to find out internal and externally. I think they, they know what the majority of the challenges are, and they, they kind of are trying to work through it, which is really, really positive, um, and there's ways around it. And I think with COVID, they, they have a strong relationship, even though it's not particularly like the A-class, if you will, but they're trying to do their best to get through to the A-class through this COVID recovery period. Um, and I really do think that they they know what's happening. And I think um, that there will be, you know, a lot of hard work forward, but it's good to see that they know the direction of travel and that they're trying to, to go for it. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Outley, you have your hand raised. Do I? I'm sorry. I was, I was <laughs> just really thinking in deep thought about what Stephen was saying. I totally agree with him. Um, okay. No, it's the it's the work forward program I wish to speak on when you when you arrive at that. Well, are we ready to arrive at it, colleagues? Yes, I think we are. Forward work. On that program. basis, then I shall continue. Thank I, you. I, I I wonder if, if it's possible, Chair, to bring the Bridge Achievement Centre uh, before us for uh, scrutiny. Um, we we haven't heard from them. I don't. I, I we haven't heard from them for quite some time. And given the fact of the current predicament that they that they've entered into, um, I think it's I think it's an appropriate time for them to come forward so they can explain to us how and then where they go forward from from then on. So how and where they go forward. I think that's an excellent recommendation. I am aware. Uh, uh, of the Bridge Achievement Centre and as I understand it they have been placed yet again in special measures. Uh, so yes I think uh, Neil uh, with colleagues agreement these again are very very vulnerable children mm -hmm. who end up excluded from uh, mainstream school and yes I think we should ask for a formal report and for the officers who are managing the Bridge Achievement Centre to come in and come before panel. Sure, absolutely. Um, request for that, Chair. Yes, please. Uh, Councillor Richards. You're muted, John. Appreciate the question and and uh, but wouldn't it be sort of correct to to allow the cabinet member who's responsible for that particular area of operation to to look at the situation first before we as a scrutiny committee drag before us so to speak uh, officers who were involved in it i'm sure they are john i'm sure they're they're, they're up to date and looking and examining that i don't think uh well i've not read anything to date regarding the bridge well i mean maybe Maybe we need to bring them all in to, to see us. Uh, I, I find that the follow on from uh, the youth justice system, and if you look at um, those in the in the PRUs, a lot of those in the PPRUs will find themselves for whatever reason in the youth justice system. And so it's we've had the understanding of where we're going forward. Now, the Bridge Achievement Centre is completely different from any other education establishment. It's not an education estab establishment. That's the first thing, even though it comes under maybe Lucy and Education Portfolio. However, their clientele base and the youth justice system work hand in hand. And for that reason, 
I think they should come before us. By all means, the, cap the cabinet member can come as well, and the head of service can come. It's not about, it's just about joining all the dots up so we, we have that going forward. That's all it is. Yeah, well, the, the reason I raise it is, is if you as an elected member have got any points or problems with the way that the Bridge Achievement Centre operates, then uh, it, it's sort of courtesy and protocol. You go to the cabinet member first. And I would suggest before it comes to the full scrutiny. You want to have got concerns, haven't you? No, 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 I wouldn't say I've got, I've got concerns. I mean, everybody has concerns, especially with educational needs. But these are the needs of the Bridge Achievement Centre, which are, which are children that go hand in hand with the youth justice system. After the presentation that we had this morning, and we can see the way that the youth justice system is developing and going forward, I just think that that the ability to see where Bridge Achievement Centre is now and going forward and during the last 12 months would give us a good indication. I mean, they're not being dragged before us. So we don't drag, we invite people. And not only do we invite, we encourage and scrutinise them, which is the correct thing to do, to make sure that that, that, that is, this is in the best public interest, that's yeah. all. But yeah. maybe, you know... Um, through, the, through the chair, to, to, to scrutinise something, you need to know all the facts. Well, you need, can to, I, you, you can need I, to have gone through all the processes so that you can do a fair and proper scrutiny. Can I, well, I don't think, I don't think that uh, to know all the facts, uh, so my members admitted this morning that they did know a great deal about the youth justice system. And based upon that argument, you would never have brought the youth justice system or the youth justice system would never have appeared before us today if we didn't know a lot of history about them. We, we judge them upon the presentation that they place before us, the history and the roadmap of where they're going in the future. And I think we've proved that we're able to judge and to scrutinise on the presentation of what they present. Right. I, I, I have no problem with them coming. If, <clears throat> if committee doesn't want to hold to account the Bridge Achievement Centre because we have had an opportunity to get down there or we have an opportunity to, to, to for they haven't engaged with us in the last 12 months or whatever. No, no, chair, chair, it? chair, I, mu I chair, must make chair. a point. Chair, I must make a point, a point of order. The, the, the point that was made by Councillor Rowdy, we should look at the Bridge Achievement Centre scrutiny. And then uh, the word predicament was used and the, and the expression, it's been placed in special measures. Now, that, that, that is the reason I've raised it. Well, that, I'm sorry, John. Excuse, excuse me now. Yeah, but I never used the word special measures. measures. Stop, please. I it's never stop. used the word special stop. measures. Stop. Somebody stop. did. Not me. Stop. Please, we need to have a proper debate not talking each over, over each other. Right. So I take the point that Councillor Routley is making. I take the point that Councillor Richards is making. Um, I am I am not clear whether the Bridge Achievement Centre is in special measures. I know that it has been in special measures previously for quite a considerable length of time. I think there was then some improvement. I'm not sure what the situation is current. But we are a scrutiny committee um, scrutinising issues which affect people. And in terms of a, uh, the way in which uh, these children are very, the, the children who attend the Bridge Achievement Centre are usually children from very difficult backgrounds not able to uh, learn and remain in mainstream school. They do fall into the youth justice system because of activities they get involved with. So I personally see no reason why we could not have a report on how the um, Bridge Achievement Centre is working and then for officers to come and speak to the report and, and give us the opportunity to question. What I'm going to do now is just go round all members of this group 
and say, would you please agree, yes or no? Councillor Trevor Watkins, would you agree with what I've just proposed? I agree for the report to come to the scrutiny committee. And if we accept that report, then I got no reason not to invite the cabinet member and any officers to answer anything which was in the report, like we've done today. Thank you, Trevor. Councillor Cleverly. You're muted, Jan. You're muted. Look, I'll give you the opportunity to type your answer, yes or no, or, or anything else. I have that opportunity whilst I come to Councillor Forsey. Yeah, I think it's important that we, we follow the proper protocols and, um, you know, if, if questions should be asked of the cabinet member first, then, then we should do that in the first instance. What, what I'm asking, though, would you agree to us having a report? Councillor Forsey. If there is a report for us to read, um, yeah. I'm, I'm happy for, uh, for us to read a report, yes. Yeah. Councillor Marshall. Likewise, I agree with my what my colleagues have already mentioned, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. I think Councillor Lacey. Um, yeah, same. I, I agree with the seeing a report um, based on what Councillor Marshall and Councillor Forsey have said. Right, so we look at the report. Councillor Cleverly, um, yes, she's also agreeing, I see here. And I'm sorry that you've got problems with your mic, um, Jan. I think you need to speak to SRS to get that sorted. How about, um, Councillor Routley, we've already got your view. Councillor uh, Richards? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm pleased, Chairman, that you've introduced the report aspect to this, because that was the point that was concerning me. This committee needs maximum information before it makes decisions. Right. And Councillor Routley didn't mention anything about a report, to be frank. And, and I agree with what you've just suggested. Thank and you very much. Chairman, um, Chairman can I say I also agree with, with, with what's been mentioned. You wouldn't bring, you wouldn't bring, and I'm sure he, uh, I'm sure that Councillor Richards is merely playing games. You wouldn't uh, bring... No. That would be ludicrous. That would be crazy. They would, of course, there would be a written report that goes without saying. Right. I'm yeah. quite happy to have the, the written report. This is not a, this is not a game. This is serious. It's about children's lives. Absolutely. Ab absolutely it is. And I think we are all now in agreement. I certainly mentioned a report at the, at the outset of our conversation. So I'm very pleased that we've all agreed that we'll ask for a report uh, on the Bridge Achievement Centre to come to us so that we can look at it in detail. And then should we need to uh, invite officers and ask further questions, that's exactly what we should do, because that's what we are. We're, yes. a, scrutin we're a scrutiny committee. Yes. We're about support and challenge as appropriate. And we need to know that, you know, if things are not right in terms of, of, of an, uh, a, a service delivery, how we can help to improve matters. So I think, Neil, we'll ask for that report, please. That's fine, Chair. So um, just to confirm, Alan, have a word with the, the managers of the Bridge Achievement Centre, just request the information report on what the committee's requested. Send it to you all as we did with this report. If the committee do want to organise a special meeting, um, we can always rearrange that and um, invite officers to um, you know discuss about it like like we did today thank you neil and thank you very much for your support for this committee it is appreciated just to make um, the committee aware as well and unless um, we arrange any meeting beforehand for the bridge achievement center the next meeting is being held in june now it's the 8th of june it'll be the end of year performance reviews right. so would it be that on tuesday the 8th at 10 o'clock and then two weeks after that it would be the second um of the end of year reports so on the first meeting it'll probably be the two social services children's and adults two yeah. weeks after that it would be education 
Well, you sure you I'm sure will send us the um, invitations for that. Councillor Richards. Yeah, Chairman, can I make it absolutely clear that I'm not voting for a special meeting of this committee on the Bridge Achievement Centre, right? I'm not voting for a special meeting to be called of this committee. I, I am prepared to await the report. I'm pre prepared to go through process. I'm prepared to establish facts, et cetera, et cetera. And then if the committee so wish, agenda this item. Absolutely, absolutely. Can I, can I echo the sentiments? Can I echo, sorry, Chair. Can I echo the sentiments of Councillor Richards? I never called for a special meeting to be called. I'm very happy to have a report come to us because that's what scrutiny is about. And if need be, if need be, if that's the will, the will of the committee, John, then they will appear. But only if it's the will of the committee. What? Sorry, Councillor Richard. So when I meant um, special meeting, it's only because we haven't got no meetings until June now. So if the committee did want this item to come to the committee, there's no space on the on either the June's agenda. So sorry if I used the wrong word there, but I simply meant we were just arranging an additional meeting. Neil, so sorry, sorry Neil, for any confusion. Neil, colleagues, all of you, what we are asking for at this time is a report. Mm which is to come to all members for their consideration. Once we have all had sight of that report, we will make uh, a decision as to the way forward. Is that OK? Yeah. Thank you. Right, I think we've more or less come to the end of uh, business today. Uh, CT, who's CT? Carmel. So, Carmel. Oh, my dear girl, I'm so yeah. sorry. I, I wasn't aware that you've been in the meeting, but very, <laughs> very pleased that you have. And thank you for your. Um, no, I don't know why you couldn't get your voice heard. Are you are you on a tablet, Carmel? Uh, no, my um, laptop. I didn't see your hand up at any point. That's weird. And also, I didn't see your picture. Oh. I thought we were supposed to turn off our cameras. There oh, I am. You're supposed to turn it on again if you wish to speak or oh, you're speaking. Okay. OK. Anyway, you've let us know. So thank you very much. So I think okay. we're all agreed now. We'll ask for that report. Yeah. But I think that's the point at which we now will say we've done our business for, for today. Thank you very much to everybody for your engagement. I can see that Trevor has got a very interesting picture on his wall. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, yes, I, I'm not sure. Is it, is it family members or is it somebody famous, Trevor? It's family.